Today's episode is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio. You'll be hearing more about them later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Honored and pleased to welcome back to Forward Guidance, macro investor Felix Zuloff. Felix, great to see you. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you for having me, uh, Jack. It's a pleasure, as always. The pleasure is all mine. Felix, where do you think we are in the liquidity cycle? You do a lot of works on cycles and how the bond market and stock market asset prices, their their relation with the the real economy, whether they're leading and and lagging. What does it say about where we are in the cycle right now that uh, stocks and bonds are on an absolute tear and both have been rallying ferociously over the past month? You know, we started the down cycle in late 21 in liquidity. And we bottomed, I would say, in March. We, we bottomed in the stock market in November, October of last year. But uh, the liquidity bottomed in March with the banking crisis that was brought on. At that time, particularly in the US and in Europe, uh, central banks injected uh, more liquidity. And then we had an improvement of liquidity. And then the Treasury was playing games. When you look at the balance sheet, how the reverse repos have come down and how they play games with the general account, et cetera. And therefore, the liquidity improvement continued. And therefore, we had a liquidity-driven rise again from particularly the late October into just recently. And so we are in to something like a rejuvenation of the liquidity cycle, but I'm not sure that liquidity cycle will continue for long. I think it will will end sometimes early next year because there are things going on in the world that are not the way the consensus sees it, in my view. You know, there are very powerful consensus views at the present time. And when I start uh, analyzing the markets, I start with a fundamental analysis, geopolitics, then the business cycle and liquidity and all that kind of stuff. But I also look at how investors are positioned. And at the current time, we have extreme positioning. We have, to my mind, we have never seen such an extreme bullishness in the bond market. The global fund survey by Bank of America is a good source to tell you where the positioning is. and. 54%, I believe, said the best asset class over the next 12 months is bonds. That is very rare that bonds are considered the best asset class by global fund managers. And stocks are far behind at only about 25% or so. There is also a strong consensus of declining bond yields, long-term bond yields. The number is at 70%. The previous peaks were at about 30%. We have never seen such an extreme in the last 20 years. JP Morgan took a survey, the Treasury desk actually took a survey, how long their clients are. And it is by far the most long positions ever their Treasury clients are. So there is an extreme positioning, betting on soft landing, and the weakening economy and the declining interest rates and bond yields. And I think they will decline somewhat further. But when you look at the extreme positioning and the extreme survey numbers, the last time we came close to something like that was in late 80, late 2008, early 2009. We had one move down, I think, by about 100 basis points or so. And 12 months later, yields were higher. So I I think the world is positioned in an extreme way. And usually when all the experts and forecasts agree on an outcome, usually something else is going to happen. So either the economy will be much weaker or stronger than expected. Both will be bad because if it's much weaker, the stock market will decline and probably decline sharply. And if it's stronger, bond yields will go up again. If the Fed won't hike again, if it's stronger, then the bond market will tighten and the bond vigilantes will reappear. 
and we could have another spike higher and probably above the highs that we have seen. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying this is an alternative to the current narrative. And therefore, we are in a somewhat a difficult situation where the trends that have started a few weeks ago in the bond market will continue, in my view, into the first quarter, but then could reverse and could, could reverse sharply. So my reading of the bond market is, yes, there will be a weakness in the U.S. economy, but I do not know when exactly in 24. It could be rather later than sooner. And therefore, we will go down to 3%, plus minus 25 basis points in 10-year yields, but we could have an interim spike to higher highs. That would make... Or most investors looking wrong, you know, and and so I'm I'm a little bit uneasy about it. We are playing the medium term trend. The medium term trend is down in bond yields. We probably have made the, the first step down short term, and are in for some bounce here in yields. And then we have a second decline, and the second decline could be to about three seventy or so in the tens. And after that, I would be very careful. What I see going on is not a picture that completely agrees with the consensus, because the consensus is also saying the dollar will be weak. That's also a pretty strong consensus. And when I look at my technicals, which actually was the reason I said bond yields could come down, my technical indicators were very bullish, the bond market. And and I saw this decline coming. The same indicators say it's very late in the medium-term decline of the U.S. dollar. And we could be in for some surprise uh, during the first quarter that all of a sudden the dollar strengthens again. Because I see uh, so many central banks around the world, particularly in the emerging uh, markets that are cutting rates because they can not because they want to, but because they cannot stand it anymore. The world economy is weak. The world economy is not strong. American investors only look at the U.S., but global real GDP growth is 1.5 percent. In the past, when you looked at that over the many decades, 1.5 percent real GDP growth for the world GDP was a recession. So I think China is weak, and China has, unlike most analysts who say they have eased, they have tightened in the last six months, despite the weakness in the economy, to support their currency. They were afraid of the currency breaking down. Europe is very weak, borderline to recession, and some countries are in recession. And the US is the only place that is surprising or has surprised on the upside. So the world economy is not strong, it's weak. The US is the strongest place. And why should the dollar decline in such an environment? You know, it only declines once we have a weak economy and the Fed begins to ease. Because if the US central bank eases, the dollar declines. If the US central bank tightens, the dollar strengthens. It is irrespective of what others do. So I think it's not a very clear picture. It is, it is some segments are in line with the narrative for a while longer, but some segments are completely different or I assess as completely different. And therefore, it's a strange situation right now. A strange situation. So some of the fundamentals do favor declining bond yields, maybe a slowing economy. However, you think that the positioning is pricing that in or maybe even overpricing that in. So, it, you know, even if bond yields go to 3%, it will be a, a roller coaster. Irrespective of we have another move up uh, to a higher high in yields before, the cycle oh, I see in summer, late summer of next year, around 3% or so. I do not see it lower. We have to keep in mind that the secular trend in interest rates and in inflation has reversed. It has gone down for 40 years. It's now an uptrend. 
what we have been seeing so far is the first upcycle in inflation and in interest rates. And we are now in a down cycle in inflation and probably in a down cycle in interest rates into late summer of next year. After that, a new up cycle will develop because the down cycle in yields will come and, and terminate when the economy is weak. It will not terminate when the economy is strong. So if the economy weakens the, and, and the stock market is lower and inflation is lower, then of course the central banks will stimulate. They will not only ease, they will stimulate because structurally our economies are weak. They are not strong. And therefore, I think we then start the, the next up cycle in inflation and in interest rates, probably in late 24 or so. And then we have a rise of inflation into the late 20s. And I think it could go, it, it will go higher than the previous cycle. Life. So it will go clearly above 10% inflation. Because when you stimulate, you do not only stimulate the economy, I think Structurally, the economy is weak. Most of the money that they inject into the system will go into asset prices and commodity prices will go up. We live in a world of conflict between rival powers. And in that conflict situation, the BRICS control three quarters of the supply of commodities. And they will use those commodities as a weapon in that conflict. And therefore, commodity prices will be supplied not as generously as in the past. They will, and therefore, will go up, not because demand is very robust, but because supply will be cut. And, and then you have rising uh, commodity prices, and these feeds into inflation rates and prices of goods. And, you know, energy, of course, is an important item. If the geopolitical situation deteriorates further, if you get Iran eventually involved in a war and Iran is getting attacked for whatever reason, they will close the Straits of Hormuz. And instead of going to $200 in oil, you go to $400 in oil. I, I'm, this is not a forecast. I'm just telling you the setup, which is very dangerous and risky for the next few years. Yeah, so that, that price of a very high price of oil, that would be, I guess, a, a tail risk. So you have this secular mid to long term view of rising inflation and rising bond yields. And you say that that trend has reversed after you know, 40 years of both of them going down. But you, you always have a, you know, a, a short term opportunity for them to go lower. What about the stock market? I've got to ask that you know, the U.S. stocks have been on a, a tear this year. What is what is your outlook on them as well as the factors that influence them? First of all, I think stocks are overpriced, particularly the leader stocks are overpriced and excessively overpriced. The broader market is not as excessively overpriced as the leading Magnificent Seven. I said in late October, this was a medium term low and we will go into the third up leg. We had the first up leg we called the low in, in fall of 22, and we had the first up leg, which we expected to be at to around 4,100, 4,200. And then we paused, and then we had the banking crisis. And that triggered off the next up leg, the liquidity from 4,200 to 4,600, which uh, I had trouble with because I did not expect it uh, uh, to run that far. And then I said in July, we have another correction coming and it corrected into October. And that was the second up leg into July. And now we are in the third up leg. A normal bull market has three up legs. Uh, there could be secular bull markets when they are very powerful, could have uh, four or five up legs. I think this is the last up leg because of the secular changes in interest rates and inflation. So this up leg runs into the first quarter. Whether it will peak in January, February, or March, I cannot tell at the present time. I hope to tell my subscribers when we are there. This current downdraft, we had the first run up 
And now we have a correction, and the correction could be deeper than most expect. It could go down to 4,300 in the S&P. And after that, I think we go up to 4,900. So big move, big rally. And, and it has to do with liquidity and with the situation that portfolio managers are in the business to perform. If they do not perform, you know, they have to change and buy the leading stocks. And that's what's happening. And because indexing is a is very fashionable these days, not only because it's easy to do, but it also protects your business as a money manager. You cannot outperform, but you do not underperform if you index. 62% of all the world index products invest in the U.S. market because the U.S. market cap is 62% of the world stock market. Now, out of that money, 30% goes into seven stocks only. It's a tremendous concentration. I read somewhere that the largest hedge funds uh, in the U.S., the 10 biggest, 70% of their assets are in 10 positions. I'm not sure whether that's right or not, but I think the concentration is dramatic. It is bigger. The concentration is bigger than in the 2000 top. It is bigger than in the 73, nifty 50 type of top. And the only thing that I would like to remind people is when the market turns down for whatever reason from a peak in Q1, the only thing they have to sell will be those seven stocks. And they are excessively priced in terms of valuation. So they have a lot to go down. They could easily go down 50% and they would still be great companies. You see? So I think we will be in for some dramatic surprises on the way down after the Q1 peak, it uh, could easily decline below the lows of last fall and fall into the low 3000 in the S&P. So that's the roller coaster I said a few years ago, this decade will be a roller coaster market. And if we are down there, of course, you have the decline in asset prices that weakens private consumption because uh, the, the way asset prices go, it helps private consumption. You feel very good if your balance sheet improves and you feel very bad if your balance sheet weakens. And therefore, you will have a weak economy, you will have a weak stock market, you will have lower inflation rates. And, and what you then expect is the normal thing. Central banks come in and they provide liquidity and they try to pump it up again. And because the economies are structurally pretty exhausted, the real economies, most of that money and liquidity they inject into the system will go into asset prices, commodities, equities, and we'll have a big run to 6,000 or 7,000 on the S&P. That's what I see ahead. And when you see that, the logical consequence is when you have higher, equity, higher commodity prices, let's say in 26, you have oil prices at $200, let's say, then your CPI is above 10%, of course. And as your CPI is above 10%, your 10-year government bond yield will not be three, you know? it will most likely be eight or something like that. And then when you discount that based on the interest rates, it leads to much lower stock prices. So that's the roller coaster I see ahead. And if you are a 60-40 type of investor or an index type of investor, passive investments, that's all right and good and dandy as long as things go up. But what about the roller coaster? What about the downside? If all of a sudden the market is down 30% or 40% or whatever, you know, you feel the pain. And therefore, I think you have to be an active investor and try to time the mini cycles that I just referred to and explained in the years to come. Very, very interesting. So you think that the third up leg of this bull market 
could be the last one. But in secular bull markets, you have four or five, maybe even more upsurges. When you, you uh, referenced 4,900 on the S&P, which would be a you know serious, somewhat modest, but serious increase from the current levels of yeah. the S&P 500. Would that be part of this up leg or would that be a fourth up leg? That would be part of this up leg. Uh, usually uh, a medium term up leg lasts uh, a few months. And three to six months in the bull market and the down leg lasts between two and three months only. A counter trend, a counter trend down leg, only two to three months. So I, I think we run into the first quarter, into a high in the first quarter. We will make minor new highs. The media will celebrate it and it will suck in a lot of investors that should not do it, but that's the way of the game. You know, people buy the most at the top and the least at the bottom. And and we, the professionals, are here to help to do exactly the opposite. And so we, we are close to all-time highs. 4,900 would be an all-time high. I, I remember reading in the, the classic book, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, the, the author saying that, you know, if there's a stock and the you know, previous all-time high was $100 and it goes 98, 99, $100. It's a psychological level. Once it breaks through, it's got a pretty serious thrust. So my question for you as a student of current markets as well as historical markets, is it still true now or maybe is it, is it even more true? No, it's, it's still true now. Uh, human nature has not changed. And even if the machines make the trading decisions, the people behind who feed the money into the markets are human beings. And I, I, recall, I recall the high in... In 72, when we broke the former high and the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones was at that time the standard index. The Dow Jones broke to new highs. My boss uh, was even so excited that he ran through a glass door. He didn't realize that there was glass and he thought the door was open and he broke the glass. Oh he was so excited because of the new high and it was an accident, <laughs> and that was it. That was it. 1050, I think it was, or 1073, or something like that at the time. So it will be. It will be exactly the same. The human nature has not changed. I think we will make new highs, minor new highs, but that is a trap. In my view, that will be a trap. And once you have a new, high, a minor new high as a trap, and then the market reverses you usually experience a very sharp decline because the trap sucks in so much capital at the wrong price that once the market turns down, they cannot stand the heat and they begin selling. Now, ask yourself, what would portfolio managers sell? They would sell what they have in their portfolio. Those are the seven stocks very overweighted everywhere. Those are the big uh, asset pieces in a portfolio, and therefore they would start that. And then selling begets selling, and, and you have a big decline. So I, I still believe we have a big decline out there, but first we go to new highs. Today's interview is brought to you by MetaMask Portfolio, your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and access a range of web free services all in one place. Overseeing your crypto assets across different wallets and networks can be very complicated. MetaMask Portfolio solves this by giving you the reins to manage your crypto from a single decentralized application or DAP. Just connect to MetaMask Portfolio to get a bird's eye view of all your coins, tokens, and NFTs, and you can easily buy, sell, swap, bridge, and stake crypto assets at competitive rates right within the app from a vetted list of providers. No more jumping between dozens of sites and apps. MetaMask Portfolio lets you do more in Web3 your way, giving you secure and convenient access to a wide range of features and services all in one place. Manage your portfolio your way with MetaMask Portfolio. Click the link in the description of today's episode to get started. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. That really is a remarkable story about your boss running running through the glass. How would you assess sentiment now in the, the stock market relative to sentiment in the bond market? How bullish is sentiment and positioning in the stock market. I check sentiment indicators every week. Every week, and I go through a certain discipline of uh, checking indicators and checking markets and going through fundamental uh, charts and price charts, uh, etc. And very short term, we were at the at the level in short term sentiment 
that is usually a short-term peak. We also had put call ratios pulling back sharply and being at the low where there is a short-term, usually a short-term peak in the market, but it's not the medium-term peak. And medium-term sentiment indicators, one particular I have in mind, usually the market peaks when the reading is in the low to mid 70% bulls. We are now at 60, so there is more room to go. We are not at 25 or 20, which is usually a bottom, but we are at 60 and we have more room to go. And therefore, I think uh, it fits very well with what I said be before, that we have more time and more magnitude on the upside until we see the peak of this rally. We have only seen one up leg of this medium term rally, one short term up leg. And we are now in a correction to that short term up leg. That correction probably scares a few people, uh, in my view. For those who are still short, it's an opportunity to close the shorts. And for those who want to play as a trader on the long side, it will offer an opportunity in probably the next 10 days or so to enter at a, at a decent price. I think the downside is about 4,300, maybe 4,350 or, or something like that. And then we run into the 4,900s and close to 5,000. And then we have to check the indicators, uh, the liquidity, because Powell has to make up his mind what he wants to do, whether he wants to end up as Arthur Burns or as uh, Paul Walker or, or something in between. You know, he has been, he has not offset and compensated the games and gimmicks Janet Yellen has been playing with the balance sheet of the Fed. And, and I think uh, that was a mistake. He probably thought that the tapering was enough to do, to do that, but I think it wasn't. And I saw that uh, for quite some time, bank lending, you know, bank lending has been very weak uh, to the real economy, but the uh, bank lending to financial companies to play the financial markets has been very strong and robust. And, and therefore, the Fed chairman should see that also because as the price is going up, strengthens the economy. It does not weaken the economy. And the, the consumer is now in a position where he has nicely growing real income because the inflation rate is coming down. The wages are up 5% or something like that. And the inflation, at least the inflation they publish is up 3, 3.5% three or something like that. So they have they have a, a real income growth, which was not the case a year ago. And, and therefore, the consumer is still doing okay. Of course, there are problems. When you look at uh, credit card delinquencies, the, the rates of the, the delinquencies are rising. They are still at the low level, but the rate of change year over year is at the highest level in 30 years. So this tells you that underneath the surface, there are problems and it's, it's not serious yet because the level is still low. And as long as income growth is in real income growth is decent, the consumer will hold up, but you have to keep in mind that the higher interest rates feed into the consumer over time with the time lag as he has to do some refinancing of his mortgage. And, and his car loans and whatever. And, and that means that even if interest rates have softened somewhat for the consumer in total, in aggregate, it's probably still going up, cost of the, the interest service, the servicing of his debt. And, and therefore there is an underlying uh, force that eventually will weaken the economy over time. So it sounds like in the short term to, let's say, you know, the middle or end of Q1 2024, you're actually bullish on stocks and bonds, maybe a little bit more bullish on, on stocks that, than bonds, although maybe I'm wrong about that. And then bullish on both, term, bullish on both, bullish, bullish on, on both. both. Middle term, you're a lot more cautious, especially on bonds. What is it going to take? What are you going to have to see in the markets, in your indicators, in your thought process for you to turn from a short-term bull to a short-term bear? In other words, wh what are you going to see that will be a catalyst or a harbinger of 
uh, a move down in stock prices, in bond prices, or a move up in yields? At the end of a medium term rally, the market is in a weak technical position. At the end of a medium term correction, the market is in a strong technical position. The market is most vulnerable when it is in a weak technical position. That means at the end of a rally. So uh, a little bad news is good enough to trigger a correction. If we have very bad news, be it geopolitics, be it the bankruptcy case or whatever, then it could be a decisive factor to turn the market down. The thing that we haven't seen at the peak of rates in bond yields is that you can go back as far as history is. At every peak, you had an event. You had either a major bankruptcy, you had a, a market crash, or you had a recession starting, and we haven't seen any of that so far. So maybe that is still ahead of us. Maybe something bad will happen in in first quarter or late first quarter. So that triggers a sentiment change and triggers selling that begets selling. I will check that, of course, with my sentiment indicators, particularly with my momentum, trend and momentum indicators. And the thing that I watch very carefully if the dollar would begin to strengthen instead of weaken, uh, as the majority expects, it would be an early indication that we are close to trouble hitting the markets. Hmm. So some sort of a bad news event in, in the world of credit, a bankruptcy, uh, something like that, could trigger a, a downward move in stocks. Uh, what do you think about the price action this year where any minor bad news event in the economy, uh, any sign that the economy is actually slowing down, not reaccelerating, was actually interpreted by the market as bullish, and the market tended to rally on bad economic news because that just meant that the Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates sooner. Uh, what do you think it's going to take to move away from that current uh, uh, regime where bad news actually, if anything, causes the market to rally because it means the Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates as the market now expects, uh, you know, it's actually pricing in, it's more likely than not that, that the Fed will cut interest rates uh, by March of next year, which, you know, compared to a month, to a month or two ago, it really is quite remarkable. I would bet that is the wrong assumption. But the interesting thing is that here, the expectation is for a soft landing, for a weaker economy, for rate cuts, et cetera. And look what's happening in the market. The cyclical stocks are outperforming the growth stocks. Cyclical value stocks for the first time in a long time are outperforming growth stocks. So the market is actually telling you a very different story of what the current narrative of investors, the media, and global fund managers is. And I watched that, and, and I said, um, this rally here will be a rally where probably Russell 2000 outperforms all other indices. That doesn't make me bullish long term, but I think it has a very good rally because it is the season for the small caps to, to perform well. Over year end into the new year, the, particularly the beaten down and the, and the laggard performers usually perform best. Uh, you also, I also said we will see that cyclicals, industrials will outperform. And not all of them do, but many do. And as a concept, they outperform. And last week in particular, the, uh, the growth stocks and the FANG stocks underperformed cyclical stocks and value stocks for the first time in a long, long time. And, and I think... This is telling you that probably in the first quarter, we may see some economic indicators surprising on the upside instead of the downside. And that could then create a problem for the bond market. And then maybe it means that the uh, rates will not be cut and the bond market will uh, tighten uh, by yields beginning to rise sometimes uh, 
from a low in the first quarter into the second quarter. And then all of a sudden, investors have to rearrange their allocation in the stock market and some bad news hits. And then you have the scenario that I outlined. Mm. So you think that U.S. economic data and U.S. economy might continue to outperform expectations as it has this year, at least for, for a short term. You know, uh, uh, many last year, especially you know, many mainstream economists were uh, forecasting a, a recession that you know, would begin in early 2023. And I think it's pretty clear that the U.S. economy is not in a recession. So do you think that the U.S. has dodged a recession and are we at the beginning of a new cycle or you think no this cycle is longer and there will be a recession it just is is a lot longer and things take time business expansion has been extended due to the easier money uh, policy since the banking crisis in march that extended the cycle and i doubt that uh, jay powell did himself a favor by doing so if that's true what i'm saying that would mean that the downside in inflation is not as big from here as people think. And we could be in for some surprises. Then there is another aspect we should keep in mind. We get every month, we get the uh, economic numbers and statistics coming through, et cetera, et cetera. Many of those numbers are seasonally adjusted and there is a problem with seasonal adjustments. So very often a year later, the numbers get revised because the adjustment was wrong. And it portrayed an economy that was stronger when it was weaker, or it was weaker when it was stronger, etc. And I think we could easily see the first quarter showing us indicators that show a stronger economy than the market is expecting, even if it's not true even if it's not true, due to seasonal adjustment problems. And, and they could lead to the bond market bouncing back from a low, as I described. So I, I would not take everything for granted what they publish in statistics. I know the market is very focused on, on these numbers. I look at them, but I think trends are more important than individual numbers. And I would not overemphasize those numbers. I, I think many of those numbers are not really true. Look, look at the inflation. If there is anybody who believes inflation is what they publish, you know, you cannot be serious. Of course, inflation is another number. My inflation is probably 10% of my basket of goods and services I consume. And, and so it is for many other people. So I think the numbers are made up. You know, the shelter part of the CPI is a problem and it is exaggerated on the downside. And recently they exchanged, what was it? Healthcare insurance premiums for healthcare insurance profits of those companies. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So I think inflation is in fact higher and that would mean that a higher and higher percentage of the U.S. consumer is struggling, in in is on the struggling more than what the statistics tell us. Mm -hmm. And credit card delinquencies are probably pointing in that direction. Hey everyone, we're about to get back in the action, but before we do, let me give you a lowdown on what's been brewing at Blockworks. Come March next year, in the heart of London. We're bringing together hundreds of the world's heavyweight asset managers. I'm talking about the big hitters, fund managers, allocators, payment providers, and the major high frequency traders. They'll all be converging at Digital Asset Summit London, the mother of all digitally focused conferences in the institutional space. If you're curious about what the big money is up to in the digital asset scene, this is the event for you. We're diving deep into the intersection of macroeconomics and crypto, dissecting where we're at at the market cycle, and we'll be getting into the nitty gritty of real world assets. So think stable coins and on-chain treasuries, it's all in mix. I'm gonna be there and so are the Forward Guide superstars. 
Michael Howell is going to be there. There's a rumor that Joseph Wang is going to be there. I don't know who started that rumor, but people are saying that. We're also getting into the minds of allocators, so you get a front row seat to what the big crypto money managers are cooking up these days. And because you're a dedicated Forward Guidance listener, here's an exclusive treat. Use code FG20 to get 20% off. Just hit that link at the end of this episode, so gear up, because I'm looking forward to seeing you in sunny London town come March. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. And do, do you think that this... Uh dispersion or this differential between reality and reported inflation where reported inflation is somewhat lower than inflation that's actually experienced by by people. Do you think that's a constant? In other words, when inflation was at 8% or 9% at its peak, was real inflation at, let's just say, 11% and now it's reported at 3% and it's actually 5%? Because if that is the case, then the disinflation, the decline in the inflation rate that has been reported by media and you know the economic statistics is actually true. It just was you know, really from 11% to 5% instead of 9% to, to 3%. In other words, what do you think about uh, the disinflation that has occurred this year? Do you think it will continue? And might I add, I think you know, in our last interview in December, you, you accurately predicted that there would be disinflation coming down from that reported uh, uh, 9%. Inflation, as reported, is following very much the previous cycle of the late 60s and 70s. And if you take uh, that as a guide, uh, then we bottom sometimes uh, next year, probably mid-year or so, and then we begin to rise from there, and we will, be, and then we will rise above ten uh, percent. Uh, I once asked the, the head of a major central bank why they publish inflation rates that are not true. You know, because they are just not true. And he said, "Well, you say it's not true, but." We have to operate with the statistics they give us. And I said, but it's not true. Everybody can tell you it's not true. And they said, my wife tells me the same thing when she goes shopping. So they know, but they have no other tool to work with. Right. And even if economic data is wrong, the market treats it, you know, you have to, you, the market is going to react to it. So, you know, accurately predicting economic data that happens to be incorrect is can be just as profitable or you know sure. time well spent as predicting it if, it, if it's not correct. Is absolutely. It, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we focus perhaps a little bit too much on economic statistics here, because I think geopolitics is is important risk factor. And you know, we are it, if you have a political event or a geopolitical event, usually the stock market doesn't care much longer than a day or two. But if geopolitics change in a way that changes the economic setup in the world economy, then it is an issue. And I think we are going through a major transition from the old world order that was uh, unipolar, US-centric, and very stable, and everybody knew how to behave uh, to a new multipolar order, and we are in the transition period. And the transition period is disorder, and the top dock is considered to be weak. And therefore, you have all of a sudden wars and aggressions popping up in Serbia, in Armenia, in Gaza, in Yana, etc., and in Ukraine because of that. And it's, of course, a, a completely different environment than in the past 50 years or 70 years because you have rivalry, you have conflicts, you have military uh, conflicts, and you have the U.S. trying to defend the old order that has already crumbled, and you have China coming up, pushing against the old order and trying to organize a new world order. And this creates conflict. So the Ukraine conflict uh, is not important anymore because it's almost over. Ukraine has lost that war. That is uh, definite. And I have said that from the very beginning, it was uh, a dumb thing to provoke the Russians that they uh, attacked uh, Ukraine. And, and the thing in Palestine, uh, Gaza, is also part of that conflict in a bigger way. It's also part of that. And I fear that once the uh, operation in Gaza is over, that uh, Israel could turn towards Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is, has bases in uh, Lebanon and in Syria. 
And if Syria gets attacked, of course, Russia has a military agreement with Syria and Russia could get pulled in to the conflict and Iran would get pulled in. And if Iran gets attacked, then all hell breaks loose. And then you have the US getting pulled in on the Israeli side. And then you have World War III. So I think the risks out there are tremendous, and that is underestimated by the market. He doesn't respect uh, what's going on. He could really change the world in a short period of time. So I, I think investors should be aware of that because those are risk factors that are underappreciated by most. I recently uh, listened to Neil Ferguson, the famous historian, and I was amazed. He gave a talk to a small group in Zurich. I attended, and I knew his opinion from six months before. And when he spoke, he was about as, as bearish on geopolitics as I was. So he was almost giving my speech. And, and I asked him, what about diplomacy? Because this setup that we are in, in the world, to really call for high caliber diplomats to solve the problems. And he said, there aren't any. And, and I agree with him, there aren't any. Therefore, the risk of military conflict is much higher than people assume. And how much of that of your concern there involves China, which is the you know, major rising power in, in the world? I think that Chinese-American relations were very, very low. Uh, would, is it fair to say that they are mildly improving from a very low level? You know, you had Xi meeting with, with Biden. You had the uh, U.S. ban on foreign investment into China, much, 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 much more mild than some, some were expecting. Uh, do you see any potential that you know, the U.S. and China can uh, get along or at least get along relative to expectations? Uh, I think China is not interested in war. China is interested in doing business, as actually was Russia. Russia was not interested in war. Russia was interested in doing business, but the Americans didn't want that. They wanted to break the integration on the Euro Eurasian continental platform. You know, uh, all of a sudden they realized that Germany has more trade with China than with the US and the integration was progressing nicely. And over time, the US would lose influence. And those are four and a half billion people, 10 times as many as in NAFTA. Uh, so th they provoked the Ukrainian war and by inviting Ukraine into NATO, they knew what, what Russia would do. The Russia had no, no other option, really, because the Americans refused to discuss the European security architecture. China is not interested in war, but of course, if they are provoked into a war, they take it. And, and I think they are stronger than we believe. I think the U.S. is relatively weak militarily. It is not the strongest army in the world any longer. The current military is 450,000 people. You saw at the latest recruitment, only 23% of the young Americans passed the test at lowered standards, at lowered standards. So that tells you there is a problem. Ferguson actually said the U.S. needs 10 years to be ready for war. They are not ready for war. And, and China will not go for war. They will go for business improvement. And the U.S. is trying to block them wherever they can on technology. And China is not reading that as a friendly gesture, you know, to say the least. And when they had a meeting, she and Biden, and tried to improve the relationship at the press conference, Biden called she a dictator, and he knows that uh, she hates that. So the whole effort was wasted. I, I think the current U.S. administration is simply not on top of uh, what it should be. And, and, and if they had better diplomats and a better government, it would, it would be very good for the world, not just for the U.S., but for the world. So that's the big conflict. And uh, China doesn't want to rule the world. 
Uh, China doesn't intervene in other eco in other um, uh, governments. Uh, they never interfere in domestic policies. The U.S. does, and uh, that's the difference. And that's why uh, many parts of the world have turned away from the U.S. Uh, towards China. Uh, the U.S. lost uh, South America. The U.S. lost all of Africa. The U.S. lost all of the Middle East. The power broker in the Middle East these days is not the U.S. anymore because it is not respected anymore. It is China. Uh, China is a power broker. China brought the conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran to an end. They are now lined up and they are in the same boat. So it's a completely different world. And, and I fear that the U.S. stock market and other stock markets running to new highs would be entering dangerous territory once we are at new highs, because all of a sudden you get the news, the bad news that trigger the downside uh, trend. And what's your view on the Chinese economy, which has been very weak? Er, uh, earlier in our conversation, you said the P uh, People's Bank of China had actually been tightening monetary policy, uh, not loosening, which is interesting because I think in terms of interest rates, they had cut them, but I know liquidity and monetary policy is much more than just interest rates. And then while we're over in that you know, part of the, the world, what do you think about uh, the Japanese economy where the stock market has been you know, on, on fire, the bulls are, are having a really good time, and there are rumors that the, the Bank of Japan, the Japanese central bank, might you know, stop yield curve control. They've been making very tepid, very, very slow strides, as well as perhaps even raise rates. Well, actually, the Chinese first cut rates that is true, but they have recently hiked short rates. Mm. Uh, and you know, China is in China is in deflation. So real lending rates in China cost six percent. Six percent real lending rates. That is tight money. That is very expensive. Of course, China has a real estate uh, problem, production, overhang of real estate. And that will take at least 10 years to work off. They have eventually, they will have to monetize it eventually, but they will do so when the West is also monetizing its problems, not before, otherwise it would be horrible for their currency. And they don't want that, that, that could trigger inflation. And I think eventually the central government will bail out the local governments. It's the local governments that are in deep financial trouble. And I think that will go to the central government and they have to eventually monetize and also recapitalize the, the banking system. The banking system is undercapitalized and, and they will lose a lot of money, of course, due to the write-offs that they have to take. So I think... The Chinese economy that used to be the driver of the world economy from, let's say, early 2000 to 2020, that game is over. The Chinese economy will be a restraining factor for the world economy and not a help for the world economy. And the Chinese want to run a large current account and external um, surpluses to really pay down their debt and, uh, and, and, to, and, and export a lot and import less. That, that's important. That's their strategy. And they are preparing for war because they fear that the U.S. Want, wants to take them to war. So they are preparing for your, for war. They are building up their strategic reserves, etc. They have turned their people into a very nationalist behavior, very nationalist, and they are beginning to, you know, block foreign products and things like that. This is not very good, and and it's just a retaliation of what the, the U.S. is doing. So the two remain in conflict, and I think the conflict will deepen over time. Turning to Japan, the Japanese stock market has been based on a very weak yen. The Japanese economy is okay, not robust, but okay. They finally got the inflation they have wanted for 20 years or 30 years. They finally got the 3 or 4% 4, 4 now in inflation. 
they are still in yield curve control modus, but they have lifted the level of the yield curve, but they are still in yield curve control modus. And once they change, the Japanese yen will become the strongest currency in the world. You have to understand the positioning. The Japanese yen was so weak, it is now undervalued by probably about 40% based on purchasing power parity. And it has been used as the most important funding currency in the world because it was a weak currency. And that means the short position outstanding is dramatic. And when the trend changes, you will have a hell of a move. We always had big moves when the yen started to strengthen. I remember 98. I was in that trade when dollar yen was 148 or so. And within three weeks, it went down to 108. It was a big move and made a lot of money. And Julian Robertson was actually on the other side and that broke his big hedge fund. And, and he now reorganized uh, everything. I talked to him before, I told him that. And I think we will be in for something very similar. Once the Japanese begin to change, so far they haven't done so. So far what we see in dollar yen from 151 or 52 or what it was to 146, 47 is a technical correction. And it could go down to 142, 143 maximum, but it's not the change yet because it's not confirmed by economic monetary policy. It's not confirmed. Once, once that comes through the fundamental change of monetary policy, then you have to be long the yen against all other currencies. So you think there will be a, a very large bull move in the, the Japanese yen against all other, other currencies? But my final question for you, Felix, and you've been very generous with your time. Thank you is your views on the dollar, which you, you hinted at earlier in our conversation. Uh, you said that you were bullish and that the consensus is to be bearish the dollar, presumably against the euro or, or other currencies. Which currencies are you, are, when you say you're bullish the dollar, uh, which currencies against the dollar are you bearish on? The, 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 the world of currencies is such if, if the dollar goes up, all other currencies go down. And if the dollar goes down, all other currencies go up, and then you have to choose which one goes up the most. In the old days, when we had the Deutsche Mark, it was the Deutsche Mark that went up the most together with the Swiss franc, and the Swiss franc actually did somewhat better. We don't have the Deutsche Mark and, and the uh, German Bundesbank uh, any longer with the hard money policy. And the Swiss cannot pursue a hard money policy any longer because they have to deal with the euro, because that is uh, the most important trading partner. So the other option is the Japanese yen. And sometimes next year, I expect all central banks to begin easing and stimulating, except the Japanese, because they have been easy. They will at, at worst not change. And, and that means the yen will strengthen. And, and, you know, when you look at currency world structurally, I think there is no good currency because they are all fiat currencies and they're all debasing long term. But the US dollar is still the least dirty shirt in the laundry, I would say. And we have now had two medium term corrections from the highs in September, I think it was last year. And, and once this medium term decline ends, which could be the dollar index could be at 100 or it could be at 96 or something like that, it could be. But when that ends, I think the dollar will attempt the upside again. And, and when you have problems in the world, politically, geopolitically, and economically, the problems in other parts of the world are bigger than in the US then I think that capital of the world is trying to flow where they think the safest harbor is, and that could still be the U.S. dollar. So I'm, I'm not as bearish as many others on the U.S. dollar. Structurally, I am bearish on the dollar, but not against other currencies. Yeah. yeah. You know, just against the intrinsic value of the dollar, but not against other currencies. 
Felix, thanks so much time for, for sharing your, your insights and your time. Tell the audience briefly about you know, what the work you do with, with clients at, at Duloff Consulting, as well as your website and how people can learn more. You can contact us on the website, felixzulauf.com. And I publish macro reports about every two weeks. And I do four job pack webinars per year and a few other webinars with interesting guests. And whenever people want to access me, they can do so. Our subscribers can have access to me with questions during the year all the time. It's, you know, macro world is a passion for me. It's not work. Yep. Me too. Felix, thank you again. And thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Jack. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at Blockworks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.